Um, so I'd like to uh, go ahead and introduce our, our next speaker, uh, Rafael Guitardo, who has uh, actually spoken previously at the uh, um, last conference. Uh, at that point, it was uh, a lot of our integration and, and customer reporting. Um, very, very nice uh, output of things. And my understanding is that he is uh, he's great enough to try a, a lot of demos. That should be a good thing to pick things up in the afternoon. Uh, but it's not. Uh, and, uh, enabling uh, enabling uh, integrated modeling of human immunological data with the use case, um, which is the, the instance of IP that, uh, that they're working with. Um, and he's at the Fred Hudson Transfer System. Okay. All right, so, um, as Joe said, um, I'll actually go ahead and try to give you a demo of some of the system because uh, I think it's a lot easier for me to try to show you what we've built um, versus trying to show you some screenshots which are you know, um, not great for showing you really how the system works. So this is really something that we've been actually working on, um, I would say probably over a year and a half now. Um, this is through a project called the Human Immunology Project Consortium or HIPC in short. And um, this is actually a follow-up to the presentation I gave last year. So I'm going to give you again a little bit of a background and, and a short overview because I know not all of you were here last year. But what is HIPC? It's basically a consortium that was set up by NIAID and, and the idea is to get you know, lots of different um, centers together. It's actually seven centers that are working together and generating lots of immunological data to try to understand the immune system a little bit better. So the immune system it's very complex, there's a lot of different components that play a role in it, and there's lots of different ways we can actually measure these components, whether you're looking at T cells, B cells, uh, chemokines, cytokines, and so on and so forth. And so the idea is really to get lots of data, try to integrate these data, and try to learn a little bit more about how the immune system uh, works and how we can maybe predict whether or not you will respond to vaccination. So this is one of the goals that we're trying to, to do here. Um, and through that, we're actually working with lots of different people. So there's the data integration, harmonization, standardization problems that we've discussed earlier. And the, in particular, there's lots of uh, what I would call sort of high-dimensional data where you're measuring lots of different things, whether you're looking at gene expression or next-generation sequencing or, or a, a multiplex uh, uh, bead assay such as Luminex and so on and so forth. And the way we want to do that is really try to not only sort of have these novel technologies, but potentially use uh, state-of-the-art computational tools to integrate these kind of different kinds of data. Um, and and through that, it, you know, so the, actually the consortium has been around for almost five years now, four and a half, and we're almost going through the end of the first cycle, and there's going to be um, there's actually a competitive renewal and all the centers that you know reapply for it will sort of start again in September. And what we wanted to have is really sort of a, a high-level database which could be the front page or the, the face of the consortium where people would sort of go there, plug in, sort of navigate, see some data user-friendly and potentially sort of do some powerful analysis. And this is really the goal of, of image space that would be that I'm talking about and I'll be showing you um, later on is really to have these sort of powerful um, database and, and analysis server which is leveraging uh, lab. Um, so the great thing that we're, we have within the HPC, and this is something that's actually been key for us, is that we don't have to worry too much about the standardization. So just to sort of show you how it works over here, so there's actually multiple working groups within the, the consortium which have been, you know, sort of tackling different sort of standardization efforts. There's been some at the assay level and some at the data level. And here I'm talking about the standards working group that have been trying to devise data standards that can be used through the different centers to try to harmonize the data and therefore you can sort of compare this data across the different centers. But then the way it works is that the standard working groups are sort of devise some novel data standards and then they be uh, sending those to the HPC centers. It's mostly sort of uh, Excel spreadsheets and, and sort of controlled work library and sort of uh, minimal information checklists, checklists and things like that. And then we're actually working with the import database. So import is the database that's funded by NIAID and pretty much all the the networks, all the major networks funded by within NIAID actually supposed to share the data within import. And so we're working with them. 
We are uploading all of these data using the standard uh, templates. They curate all the data. They put it into a uh, nice uh, standardized schema. And then what we do is that we just export the data that we care about from import, and then we import those into UnionSpace. So in a way, we don't have to deal with the data curation, the standardization, though we do some of it because sometimes we identify some errors, so we have to go back and let them know and fix some things. And there's a couple of, of other things that are different. So, for example, import, they only store sort of FCS files, and they only store sort of raw data uh, um, for microarrays and not necessarily process data and so on and so forth. So we try to standardize that within Union Space. So we add another layer, layer of standardization that really helps with that. And then the idea is that we wanted to be able to do some analysis within Union Space itself and also be able to export the data. Maybe you want to just, you know, save the spreadsheet and uh, work in your favorite tool, and um, or you want to leverage some of the APIs that are existing within LabKey to maybe directly sort of uh, connect to the database, or at least to the server, and get the data that you care about. And one that we really care about is using the R API, and we've built a couple of new things to interacting with R within image space, and I'll be showing you that later on. This is actually what I discussed last year as well. Any questions about the workflow here? Okay. Um, so why do we want to use R? And you've, you've heard you know, R a lot today, and there's an R API. Now all the tools that are really good and comparable to R, but to me R is really the gold standard for doing sort of novel statistical modeling or sort of uh, bioinformatics and high dimensional data modeling and analysis. It's open source. There's tons of packages that, that you can use. It's community driven. And basically, all of the statisticians and bioinformaticians that develop new tools typically either use, you know, uh, Python or R, and, and you know, most of these statisticians actually use R. So there's really tons of stuff that you can use and leverage directly. And this is what we we love about it. And really, for most of the the analysis that we care about, bioinformatics is really the gold standard. So there's, there, there was already an API within LabKey under which you could use R, right? You could write a report, and many of you are actually using that. You write your report, and it gets executed, and it shows you sort of the, the uh, results of the report. I talked um, about that last year in the sense that it wasn't really flexible. We wanted to have a little bit more, so I'm not going to go through the details of all of that again. But just to summarize the two main um, new APIs that we've worked with and tried to incorporate uh, in collaboration with LabKey. The first one is called RServe. What we wanted to do is to be able to basically send the computation to a dedicated server, and therefore it's a little bit more powerful. You can do more things, but more importantly, we can uh, maintain a persistent connection with the server. So we can sort of do some calculations, say plot you know, something, and then just change the variable slightly and then we plot it again. So we don't have to redo all the computation, right? Because if you were to use the current API, you execute, and then you close, and then you execute again. So you have to start everything again. So this is very helpful for doing some more interactive plotting, and I'll show you that. The other one's called Neater, and this is something that's very powerful for reproducibility. People use it a lot. You can sort of mix text and code, and you can really create a nice sort of output, whether you're using HTML or another format. But you can almost sort of write an entire paper like that, where you have some text, and then you have some R calculation. The plots get embedded in it, so you can mix table and, and figures. And we heard that today, that you couldn't really mix a, a table with a figure um, this morning. And, and I'll show you that this is possible within this environment. So very efficient. And it's also computationally efficient, because you can cache uh, calculations. Yeah? What do you mean by reproducible? Reproducible meaning that the, um, so we get the data from R, right, from LabKey, so the data are in LabKey, right, so if, if nothing changes, they, the data is the same, if you haven't changed the R environment or the packages, it will be fully reproducible because you can reproduce it, so you log in, you can execute that report, and, and it will be um, executed every time someone logs in and wants to, to see that report. But Neater is pretty clever in the sense that if it knows that the data hasn't changed and the code hasn't changed and, and the engine hasn't changed, it's actually not going to rerun everything. It caches things. But if you change the data, it will know that and will reproduce everything. Right. So it's fully reproducible in the sense that code, data, everything lives in one environment, and, and you don't need anything else to uh, reproduce that, which is a nightmare when you work with different things. I mean, LabKey is pretty good that way, but in general, it's very hard to reproduce stuff. 
So this is just to, to show you the, the infrastructure, the way it works, and why we wanted to have our server. So the, the idea is that we actually have uh, the LabP server, the database server, and we have a dedicated server for the computation. So you can have sort of a more powerful machine where you can uh, basically send all the jobs using our serve. You don't have to worry too much about it. It just looks like you're uh, using regular R as a configuration, but it's more clever in the way you can um, deal with the calculation and interact with the server. And we can uh, talk to you more about that if you have any questions. Um, yeah, so what we wanted to do is really sort of combine the best of both worlds. So R is really good at doing sort of uh, analysis and stuff like that, but you have to write some code and, and you know, for some people there's certainly uh, a learning curve and it's difficult to do it. So we wanted to leverage R and all the infrastructure that's there, whether it's analysis or visualization and leverage LabKey, which is user friendly, you've got an interface, right? So what we wanted to do is to build some modules where the interface is pretty and it's easy to use, but it leverages R and it just sort of, you know, connects the two together and you don't have to write any code, you just sort of have a point and click GUI interface that you can use. But code is always available and I'll show you that. So we built lots of different things and I'll show you some of that today. Okay, so um, I really wanted to take a lot of time to go through um, the demo so that you can see things. Feel free to interrupt anytime, ask questions. Um, I have you know about half hour to go through that, so that should be plenty of time. Okay. All right, so first we're gonna see if that showed up well. Maybe I'll just full screen here. Yeah, that should be fine. Okay. So this is, by the, by the way, this is even space is really available. You can go log in. Um, well, you can go and see it. You won't be able to log in. You can request a login. We're actually supposed to be transitioning and having a public server uh, very soon. It's actually a super bad time for us because we're actually switching over to new servers. We're transferring everything. So we have lots of different servers running around. And so if things look a little bit clunky, that's normal. Um, things will get better uh, with time. Uh, but I wasn't afraid to do a demo anyway. Um, okay, so let me just see if it's the right password here. Okay, so th this is the usual IP stuff, and I'm not going to go through all the detail. But um, basically, you, you log in, and the first um, step is going to be well, you know, show me the data. How do I find data that I care about? And so we actually. I mean, the great thing working with LabKey, and, and I think many of you know that, is that we really benefit from each other in the sense that someone is working on something, well, we can leverage that and vice versa. And the first thing that we wanted to do, actually, it's not the first thing, but the one thing that we wanted to do in, in order to find data more easily was to leverage what had been done within the CDS project. Um, so it's not exactly the same, but this is um, using some of the code that's roughly the same, and we call that the study finder that will allow you to find um, data sets that you care about. So the study finder is organized with uh, variables, so study variables that you might care about, so species, condition, um, assay data, type, time point, and, and so on and so forth. And very similar to what was shown to you today, uh, either within Argos or CDS, which are certainly more polished and more elaborated version of that, it uses sort of a, a filtering approach uh, under the hood that's pretty efficient in the way it's doing it. So let's say, you know, you start here, and by the way, we show you all the studies that are, you know, loaded in in space. And because all the studies are coming from import, you can actually click here, even though we haven't loaded all of the studies into in space within the import database, you can see what the, the studies are. And the idea there is that maybe you can find extra uh, data from import, but more importantly, you'll be able to tell us, be like, oh, these studies are really good. It would be great to have it in, in, in space, and we could load that up. So anyway, so let's say, you know, um, we want to, so we want human data, and we're going to, so, um, Everything is human, uh, of course, here. And let's say we want uh, influenza. And let's say we want some uh, data that have HAI, right? So right there, you can see that it's filtering lots of data sets. And then I've got a uh, you know, much um, a narrow choice, choice of data sets that I can explore. 
So uh, we'll actually go and explore this one. This is not actually a heat data dataset. This is actually a data set that was uh, generated at Rochester, where they also um, use LIPE. And it's an interesting study because there's a lot of time points. So I thought we should go there. So if you click on this, it will tell you what the study is, the PIs, the short description. And then you will see two links here, one that actually brings you to the import database. So because the data are imported from import, we actually share the accession number. So you can always know that that study is the same as the one that is in import. And if you click on the view study, then that will take you to that study page where you have the usual sort of study environment for um, LiveKey. There's a couple of neat things that we, we do right there. So there's the study overview. We actually um, parse the study schema, the uh, import schema to extract the information that we care about, which has PI, uh, uh, you know, title, description, so on and so forth. So you have all of that here. Uh, again, we always link it back to import so that people know exactly what we're talking about. There's a reference. And there's actually um, another thing that we do that, you know, it's kind of neat. The, we looked at the citations for the papers that were published within that study. And then we actually go into PubMed and say, well, what are the papers that are related to this paper according to PubMed? And we give you a list of it here with links. That's updated. That's actually that's actually done in R, so R is querying PubMed, and that's um, used as a report. So this is what I talked to you about. This is actually the neater environment. So everything is done in R, and we display an HTML report on that. Um, so let me actually just impersonate a user reader, which will be um, a little bit better, because we've got some profiling here. As I said, this is sort of ongoing testing and things. So I'll just impersonate a user here, which will be a little bit better. Okay. Um, then there's the usual stuff where we, you know, we have the, the subject information and, and we try to present the data in a really standardized way so that if you go from one study to the next, it will look, it will look exactly the same. So there's really sort of slight customization of the existing lab key features. Then we have the clinical and assay data where we list all of the, the data sets. We also have access to the raw data when we have raw data and we have the demographics and the court information. The one thing that we wanted to do, so some of you know that there is an existing way of, you know, uh, plotting data within LabP. If you go into uh, a grid and then you try to plot something, you can do it very easily. But you sort of have, and this was shown by grid within the CDS as well, which is leveraging that. But because here we know exactly what we're looking at, right, it's well standardized, we're getting data from import. So when it's, it's an HAI data set, I know what it is. When it's an ELISA, I know what it is, and so on and so forth. I can sort of try to guess what would be the best way to display the data for you. So we built something that we call the Data Explorer that leverages R as well, and I'll show you that next. So we we have a list of modules, and I'll go through that next. Um, but we also put a little link here next to the data view so that you know right there that you can explore data using the Data Explorer. So the Data Explorer is a custom module, which is uh, which we built, which has sort of a nice interface where you can select data, you can select clock type. And everything is actually done in R, and we'll sort of um, get the data from R based on the filter that's been selected, plot it, and return the plot to you. So I'll show you that. So the first step is select the data set. So here are the data sets that are available within that study for you to plot. So we can you know, select HAI. And when you select that data set, actually there's a data tab where you can sort of see the data in the grid, right? And so the grid is dynamic in the sense that if you change the data set, the grid is going to change. Um, the other thing is, which we'll, you'll see, um, we've tried to harmonize and standardize the way the modules look in the sense that, you know, it might not be the best way to do it and, you know, maybe it would be great to get feedback from you guys, but we wanted to have some sort of a semi-consistent environment where when you go from one module to the next, you will sort of see the similar tabs, depending slightly on what the module does, but you will always see the about and help, which tells you what does the module actually do and help, it tells you about the different parameters. So there's a description of the different parameters that you can uh, pick and choose. And this is coming from sort of a more, uh, you know, sort of um, statistician slash developer where we work a lot with our packages and that's typically the way that these things are done. Um, so if you know nothing about the data, you might, you know, say, well, I don't really know how to plot these data. So please help me and tell me how I should look at these data. So we've sort of had, we've built some different plot types. And the first one is, oh, we'll try to guess what should be the best plot type based on what data you're trying to visualize. And basically the rule is how many variables are there in that data set, right? If there's too many, I'm going to 
to a heat map if there's you know not that many I'm going to do a box plot. And then what this will do is that you will look at the data here. I haven't done anything here, so it will just grab all the data and do the plot automatically. The one thing that you will see when you look at data, um, maybe it's not apparent over here, but um, depending on the type of data set, what's, what's difficult, as many of you said today, is sometimes the data that you have in the grid is not necessarily what you want to plot, right? You might need to pivot your data or reshape your data. You might need to uh, summarize the, the values, so maybe, you know, calculate and aggregate over uh, replicated values and so on and so forth, right? And this is why we wanted to do that, so that we can uh, do all of that, basically, data managing for you and just display what you care about. So here it's a little bit slower because we need to go and check what's in the data set. Then we're basically going to um, start R. R is going to apply the filter, retrieve all the data, summarize the values within uh, subject IDs, and so on and so forth. So this is what it's showing. So in that data set, there was only one cord. It's TIV, so it's an uh, influenza vaccine. And what they've looked at is basically antibody response, or HEI, over time. And you can click on it, and that will sort of um, zoom that plot. And what you see is that there's a sampling over time. So three days before vaccination, zero is vaccination, and then it sort of goes up. And you can see that there's basically a peak immunogenicity around maybe, I don't know, the 9 to 10 based on the antibody response. There's lots of variability. And the great thing is that because we actually always join the IC data with the demographics, we can display demographic information such as the age and the gender of the subjects. Now, the one thing that you see is that there's certainly you know, a very high responder here even before vaccination. And that's pretty typical of, typical of influenza because you know, you, maybe you got vaccinated the, the previous year and there's sort of uh, cross reactivity. And so you might get a response. Maybe what you care about is really what is the response that induced by the vaccine. So maybe you can normalize the baseline here. So say, well, just look at the full change uh, compared to the um, pre-vaccination time point. And so we have that here. And you can just update the plot. So you will normalize the baseline. You will see that will sort of uh, remove that sort of variability that you see um, uh, before vaccination, so almost everything is zero before vaccination, and then it sort of increases. So this is auto, so they will do uh, box plot, so we can do box plot, which is the same, and we always have sort of additional parameters that you can use to for tweaking. So for example, um, maybe we want to add another demographic information, so we can do uh, uh, maybe race, and we can do um, maybe the size for age, so we can basically use another aesthetic variable here, and you can update the plot. And what this will do is that it will, now the, the point size will be proportional to age, the shape will be gender, and the, uh, the color will be the race. So you can have up to basically three uh, different demographic variables that you can show in the plot. Okay, the other great thing, um, well, let me show you another data set first. So you can um, just pick another data set where maybe there's, um, let's just try this one. And I'm just going to uh, maybe reset to what it was before. Oh, man, when you did that first one, did you, did you set the, the parameters for the graph? It's done automatically. So by okay, default, yeah. you say, you know, the most, the two things that you might care about is gender and age. Right, okay, so these, these are set by default. Right. Yeah. Which is what I was uh, telling you earlier is that we really want to make it very easy for people to see things very quickly. Yeah. And because it's across studies and across centers, we want to standardize things as much as possible so that when you see one thing in one study, you can see it very quickly in the other study. So here we're going to um, change that. So this is another data set, Elijah, and there might be multiple analytes. So that's why I wanted to look at that data set. Okay, so here you will see that there's actually three different highlights. So there's IgA, IgG, and IgM, and uh, we'll sort of show you roughly the same plot. And what I wanted to show you is that what I wanted to build here is something that to have the grid that's attached to the plot is that you can use the filtering capability of lab key. So let's say, you know, I only want to look at maybe IgG and uh, IgM. So this will update the grid based on the filter, right? And then you can sort of plot again. And this will filter the data and just show you the filtered data. So we think this is, this is pretty cool because we're combining the 
really lack the flexibility with the powerful R engine and the ggplot environment. Yeah, we, we, they do, but we do a couple of rules. So if there's no analyte, we just automatically add an analyte column and it's called blank, so you don't see it. So we do a couple of tricks to handle the, the non-standard format. But as I said, the key is really standardization, right? And uh, you know, we're very lucky that we don't have to deal with that to some extent. Right, so first of all, everything we do is always open, so you can go on, on GitHub, all the code is there, so anyone can go and have a look. And this is really, um, you'll see that on my slides, uh, it's one of the maybe point of discussion, and I brought that up last year, but it would be great to maybe have some sort of a consistent way or guideline on how do you make a module, right? What should it look like? Maybe we can sort of have a consistent environment that people can follow so that, you know, it's a lot easier to use your code versus my code and so on. Okay, so let me jump back to the slide. Um, yeah, there's a new yeah. space hosting. Uh, currently, it's hosted at the Hutch. Okay, but it's actually we're migrating everything to um, Amazon, which is really a real pain because we've got three servers running and, and things like that. But this is because someone else is going to maintain it from now on. Okay, so I think I've showed you that as well. So the other thing that we really built within image space is how can we best make use of gene expression data, right? So may, many of you might know that there was already some sort of support for gene expression within image space. There was a couple of gene expression modules that were sort of, you know, uh, dependent on the platform you were using and, and you had to have the data already sort of processed and things like that like that. But what we wanted to do, and this is the work we've been doing with Kevin and Lapke, is we had, because we're working with lots of different centers, some use Illumina, some use Affymetrics, there's actually some Ionisic, so we wanted to have a consistent framework that we can maybe basically have some sort of pre-processing that will output something that's standardized, and then we can make use of that standardized data set. Okay, so we basically revamped the gene expression module so that we can use the R engine you, I will show you that quickly. You can basically have a um, set of files. So let me, actually, let me just show you that. You can go through it and um, let me just find another study. So we'll just go back to the study finder. And uh, maybe I wanted to go through this one here. Okay, isn't the study. So the, the way it works is that we actually um, perform the query of the data files that are being used for gene expression. So you'll see it here. And that's the gene expression data file. So this is a list of basically subjects and all the information that we have and then map to a gene expression file. And what you can do now, actually I will have to just stop in person again so that I can show you that very quickly. If you go into that gene expression files, I'm not going to go through the entire process because it's already done, but just to give you an idea of, uh, oh, I'm not in the right study. Sorry? Yeah, so what we do with the RNA we actually do all the pre-processing before we do all the alignment, we summarize to a gene expression uh, matrix. Right, which is just basically recount the matrix or TPM or RPKM, whatever you want the unit. And then it's just a gene expression matrix. So the, the module we built is not really a microarray module, it's what we call the gene expression matrix. So everything you, you got into a matrix, you can get it to work with. Okay, so we'll go here and I'll show you again the, the list of um, gene expression files. And so what you see now is that I've got that create matrix Thing. So you have got a files of gene expression, and then you can click on those, and then you can create a matrix. Basically, all that it knows is that it maps to your file, and then I'm not going to show you here, but you basically enter a name, and you can add a description, and then you can select a feature annotation file. So you know what do the feature in your matrix map to in terms of gene and gene IDs and so on and so forth. And then um, you can select the pipeline. So what is the code that you've written to analyze this particular uh, data set? 
and we've got code that will know what to do with these files. So here, because it's Affymetrix, we can leverage all the Affymetrix packages in R. We can do the pre-processing output to the matrix, the pre-processed and normalized gene expression matrix, and we store it in the database, but just as a flat file. So there's basically a path where we know that the matrix is in all the modules that we use that make use of that matrix. We'll know exactly what it is and what uh, to do with it. So I'm going to... Um, let me just impersonate it again so that it's slightly better. And um, this is ready for anyone to use. Um, so then what we build is basically modules that can make use of that gene expression matrix. And this is, again, a consistent layout that you will find within all the studies. We'll always have the overview tab, subject tab, clinical and acid data, the modules tab, and the reports tab. The modules are really the modules that are sort of user-friendly, there's an interface, you point and click, and it does things. The reports are just our reports that basically you don't really have much flexibility uh, except the data filtering that's built in within LabKey. And we're, you know, we're hoping to have a much greater list of things you can do, but we felt that this was a good start in terms of doing analysis within LabKey. So we've got, you know, different modules for doing um, analysis of just typical data sets for visualization. We've got the gene expression explorer. So I'm going to go and do an uh, immune response predictor that we've um, um, we built, you know, maybe that was one of the first modules we built, actually. So the idea is to say, well, can we find early time points um, based on the gene expression that will predict um, um, basically um, um, vaccination efficacy, which here is sort of measured by anybody within the, the field of influenza. So basically what we want to do is predict the HI response based on um, early time point gene expression. You can select a testing cohort. Someone sort of mentioned testing and training this morning with independent data. Well, if you have that, you can do it within these data sets. There's actually, within the study, there's two cohorts, independent cohorts, so we can do that. So we're going to test them, train the model in the TIV cohort, and we're going to test it on AIV. It's not ideal because it's two different vaccines, but you know, this is just to show you how it works. You can select a time point, um, whether you want to predict using the uh, day three measurements or the day seven measurement. So here we're going to do day seven because there's a greater response of gene expression, and then we're going to run. And this is using the neater environment that I told you about. So there's two API, there's the R server where we basically sort of have a persistent connection. It's mainly for plotting, and this is using the neater where we basically have a script. We ship everything to R. There's a report that's being generated, so everything's being analyzed, and the report is being displayed. So this is what I was telling you about earlier, is that you can mix figures and tables. So here we've got sort of a nice tables, and everything is done in R and display to you. So here's showing you the two cohorts, cohort A and cohort B, so TIV, LAIV. This is the predicted response, so based on gene expression, this is what I predict that GI will be. Based on the observed response, so we get pretty good within class prediction, which is typical, because that's the data that we use for prediction. And there's poor prediction within the LAIV group, and that's normal because they're really two different batch and regimens, so you wouldn't necessarily expect one to predict the other. We show you the genes that are the best predictive here. So you've got a list of genes, um, and you can actually even know what they are. So if you click on the link here, it will actually take you, uh, take you to a new page where you can sort of, uh, probably too small, so where um, you will actually show you the, the gene within the known modules. And uh, we've got the p-values, and then we even show you sort of a heat map of the expression values for each subject within the core. So this is sort of telling you that these genes within that module actually predict the HI response pretty well. So I'll, uh, you know, for interest of time, it's keeping a lot of details, and you can ask me later on. But it's really to show you lots of different things you can do. Um, so now another thing that you might want to do is not really prediction, but you want to visualize your gene expression explorer in terms of other data sets. So this is, um, I think I just opened this same one. No. So you can select a response, and for now we've hard-coded the HEI, but we want to look at more things. The great thing with the HEI is that it's highly standardized across studies and labs and centers. Um, you can again select multiple cohorts. So what this will do is that you will give it a list of genes, and you want to say, well, just do me a scatter plot of HEI response versus these genes. You can again select different time points, so we'll do day seven, because that's what we use for prediction. Um, We'll normalize to baseline again, because I think that's informative. And here you can just add genes. Um, 
So there was IGL, I think one that was selected, I believe this one, so we'll put this one. Uh, there was IL-8, I think that was selected in the model. And in the original study for that data set, um, they actually reported one gene that was uh, negatively correlated with HAI, and that was CAMK4. So you can do that, and what these will do is that it will read the expression matrices from file. It will um, select the genes, the subset of the genes that you selected, and do your scatter plot of HAI, which is the log fold change at day seven for each of the genes. And this is what you get, and again, you can zoom in here. Um, and so you can see that there was that sort of negative correlation that was reported in the original study for KMK4, and you can see that there's good correlation for IGL, uh, that's um, immunoglobulin gene, um, that was selected from the model, and there's sort of negative correlation with RA, and that's what I was again selected in the model. So it's a great way to sort of validate what you have or when you read something about a gene. You can add as many genes as you want. Okay, so... But, but here, when you were showing for the, for the... I think you were using the human exon arrays. What was it? The, uh, as of HD133, that's Affymetrix. Yeah, the Affymetrix one? Yeah. But if you're, if you're selecting the annotation, you're actually, you're actually doing the processing. It, it looks like you uploaded the CEL file. Yeah, so what we want to do is, again, we want to standardize things across yeah. platforms. We don't actually use the, the cell file from the FMatrix. We can get all the annotations from Bioconductor. Okay. So we can standardize the gene names. And this is something that we're working on, Kevin, just to modify the, the gene expression module so that we can even write the annotation directly from R to the database so that this will ensure that the gene symbols are the official gene symbols that are consistent across yeah. studies. Because that's kind of a nightmare to work with different you know, data sets across studies, and so this is something we're working on, and that's what we're basically just using the ones that we, we uh, trust and we care about. Um, so I've showed you that, and what else did I want to talk about so I don't have very much time? Well, I'll show you that as well, so I guess I'll, I'll go through the end, and then um, we'll wrap up, and, and we'll see if you have any more questions. I'll be happy to show you more things. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about, which I think is super important for people like us, is having an interface, and, and this was um, echoed by many of you today, is, is great. People can point and click and can do things, but at the same time, it's not so great, right? And when you really want to do powerful analysis and you want to uh, do some things across lots of different data sets and you want to standardize things, you don't necessarily want to click and point and click and point and click and point, right? So there's a middle ground where it's good for exploration, and that's good for some people, but for others it's a limitation, right? So people like us, which love to work you know, in R and doing a lot of programming and stuff, it's not necessarily good. So what we wanted to do is leverage the standardization and the um, existing um, LabKey interface, so the all LabKey package, which can, can be used from within R to download data sets. But make it a little bit easier because, again, we know exactly the study schema. We know exactly how the data sets are stored. We are doing things in a standardized fashion. We want to simplify that process. So here's a quick example of how it works. So typically, um, this is the, the bottom is the LAP key package. So you need to say what is the, the URL of your um, server, and then you need to give it the path of the study, and then you need to give it the schema name, and then the the data set name, and you have to sort of know the data sets, and you can query that, but it takes a little bit more work. And then the data that you get is sort of not so standardized. I mean, it will give you a data frame, but what if you have uh, gene expression data sets? How does that work, especially if it's not stored in the database? So we actually work something where you can just create a connection. You don't have to worry about the URL, where the study is. We know exactly where it is. We know all that for you. So you say, I want study, um, you know, 269. And this will create a connection, and then you can say, list me all the data sets that are you know, in that study. It will tell you that there's all these data sets, and it will also tell you that there is these expression matrices that have been computed and then you can get. And then to get that data set, you just say, get data set HAI, and this will sort of give you a data table that you can work with from within R. What we'd love to do is to do something similar, but instead of having one study, we'll have multiple studies. We'll be able to combine stuff across the studies. So it's a great way for having sort of both of, both of, of the, the two worlds again, the, really the people who want to use the interface and the point and click and that more comfortable within sort of a user-friendly environment and the people who just want to leverage the standardization and the fact that there is, you know, lots of data available within the space. Um, 
Okay, so just to conclude, so we're going to be working the the mis the main um, goal for us this year working in space will be to enable sort of cross study analysis and integration. So we've got some of the machinery in place, but it's just making it available and, and workable within both ImSpace and R. And of course, we'll be working with lots of people to that new data. So we'll, we're going towards the end of, of the, the current uh, um, consortium, and then there's probably going to be lots of new data available. We'll be adding new one and probably new assay data and technologies um, through the next cycle as well. And the, the point of discussion that I just uh, mentioned is the community-driven um, place where we can have modules and maybe some sort of guidelines for doing that. So there's a lot of people involved, so we really want to thank the LiveKey team, uh, uh, Greg and Ono who are sitting there in the back, especially Ono who's been sort of working uh, uh, extensively on making sure that things work for the demo, so it's been very helpful. And, and these two people, um, you know, they're great if you have questions as well, because they do most of the work. I, I have the pleasure to uh, present that to you and to give you the demo, but frankly, I'm not the one who's doing most of the work. And obviously funny, so I'll stop right here. Thank you. <laughs> questions. So feel free to ask questions. I mean, we've got um, officially four and 24 seconds. <laughs> so if you want me to go over something else, so I can show you again on the portal or whatever, you know. Are you, um, you know, with our Yeah, I mean, we've talked about that. Frankly, we haven't dealt with that problem yet. Uh, but that's only an issue, but uh, I think it's an issue with anything, right? I mean, whether you're upgrading Tomcat or you're upgrading Latkey or, you know, something that fixed the bug, but there's another one that came up. And so, some, you know, I mean, you, you have to test, basically. And that's what we want to do is to have the... So we have a test server, but we've been doing so much development that it's been, you know, mainly development versus testing. But now that we're sort of maybe sort of slow the, all the development of, of the new technologies and so forth, I think we'll be able to do a little bit more testing. And probably what we'll do is that we'll have two R versions on the test server, and so we'll be able to sort of quickly swap one for the other so that we can test and revert. And, you know, I, and there are solutions that people have tested to deal with these kinds of things, so I think it's going to get better and better. Uh, but that's an issue. We'll have to address it when it comes to it. Yeah. Sorry. Can you talk a little bit about the um, pipeline of data from import? Are you getting all that study metadata from them as well? I mean, is it automated? It's semi-automated, and we're going to probably have it slightly more automated. So there's a, a SQL dump, and that basically then we just import that. So we can, it's a zip file of all the studies, but that's, and that contains most of the assay data and all the metadata. So this is sort of, and, we, and that's automated. So we have a script that will read everything and will create all the studies. Is that, was that standard from import already, or did you have to work with them to? That was standard. So they had their schema, so everything was in place. So we had to work around their schema. So we're not actually really using the study schema. Well, we're using some of the study schema, but we had to basically sort of copy things over from one schema to the other. Um, and, and Matt's been working on all of that. And that works pretty well. We have to tweak it every now and then when they change the schema or when there's a new acid data type or things like that. But but then there's the other things that there's all the raw data files that's sort of not really automated and so we're slight, slightly working on that. So um, trying to automate that process as well. All the FCS files, the raw data files, microarrays and stuff like that. But that that's not too bad. We're much better than we were a year ago. So I don't believe we're very well. What's, what's the range of studies that get fed into the it's pretty big um, range in what sense, in sort of applications or, or... Is it like only studies funded by import get into import or is it all the new... So it's, it's technically I believe it's the all... Data get in? It, it should, yeah, because it's funded through, through uh, diet and, and so it should go there. It's not all of NIAID, but it's a big proportion of NIAID studies. Uh, so anything... Right? Yes. Oh. Transplant. Yeah. So that's a lot of stuff. And that's probably more than we care about, actually. A lot more. But um, 
it's another good thing is that when you do research nowadays, you know, whether you work on HIV, if you want to make progress on HIV research, probably you have, you have to look at non-HIV data as well, right? So it's, it's a good thing to have sort of a, of a great diversity in the type of, uh, you know, pathogens and, and diseases and cords and stuff like that, and, and import is really good that way. Yeah. I don't have a lot of good experience with Vitter, and I, I wanted to gain more experience. Did you say that you made that you have your scripts and code? It's in it's in GitHub. Yeah. So everything is in GitHub, and the other thing that I didn't show you, but um, so when you have a module like that, if you click on it, that should open a tab with the code, so you can actually yeah, see the code um, on all the different modules. So. Um, so everything is available, but we, we actually, we've been much better at doing things. So for example, every time we have a report, we don't just do the report online, we create a module for it, and that module lives on GitHub, and then that way we can just modify and just load up the new module and things like that. So we separate sort of the database and all the, the, the reports and stuff like that, and all the modules. Uh, so we've been much better, and Elena has been doing all of that work pretty much, so he can, he can tell you a lot more about it. Isn't it shiny? <laughs> uh, we we've been talking a lot about you know I think you assuming you're talking about shiny applications within R yeah so we've been talking a lot about having shiny we've discussed that actually with uh, Dax and others um, and that's probably still something we'll explore I mean shiny is is better in a way that it's a lot easier to get started on stuff because you just write R code and pops up basically the other UI and stuff for you so we don't have to write any HTML. But at the same time it's not as flexible as X which is used here for, for JavaScript. So um, I feel like it's we've you know we've been pretty good now with that we've got this sort of consistent uh, um, module interface. We have much more um, I would say sort of rapid at developing new modules. Um, so we'd love to explore uh, shiny stuff if other people are interested, you know, be happy to collaborate on that as well. So the short answer is no, but we've been thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so really, uh, I got quite uh, yeah, leverage uh, for, for R. So one thing I again like with uh, Lasky, uh, is the ability to share something that comes with another user, and with the view is basically a nice thing where I find two variables and do that. Right. So, yeah. So we have reports. So there's some reports that are hard coded. I mean, there's there's sort of two ways you go about it. You know exactly what you want to do. You have the report and you save it, right? And that's good. But for some other things, you don't know what's the best way to do it. So we want to make it sort of reproducible so that anyone can sort of do that. So I guess if you wanted to show that, you will have to describe. Hey, select these genes. You know and um, so I mean, you know, it's it's again. I think there's sort of two different purposes. One is really you want to share that, and you've got a, that that report, and, and the other one is making it a lot more accessible. It's a lot easier to do, but it's much harder to say because it's point and click and it's more exploratory, right? I would find interesting to be able to share a report with people Yeah, we've we've, been, we've talked a little bit about that. The other thing is um, that Ian mentioned, but. But this is a plot, right? So you can drag and drop and put it on your desktop, right? So you, you could just send that to anyone. Uh, so that's easy to do at this. Um, then you will, let, you know, I mean, all the information is there. It's not terribly complicated to reproduce that. For the the, the R report, again, that's an HTML file, so these can be. Uh, I mean, we could save it actually. That's that's a good thing. You could do it, but you can certainly ex ex export it. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean that. I, I, you know, I think there's a few things we can do to improve it, and that's maybe a good suggestion to do. That. Yeah. Well, that's that's you know. Um, Sorry, I forgot your name. Um, we just asked that earlier. Um, 
I mean, we'll have to test it, right? I mean, the, the idea is that, the great thing about LiveKey as well is that people who are using it are not supposed to mess up the system, right? It's, you know, they're readers, and so they're not gonna upgrade R in the background, and then, you know, everything breaks, right? So the, 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 the reality is that you should have sort of a testing environment where you upgrade R and you have maybe some, you know, suits of tests that you will run and, and check that. And, and if things break, then it will fix it, but usually you want to test it, you know? And, and we've discussed that, and, and what I'd like to do, I mean, one solution that, that I want to do is leverage image space or the package and basically build a lot of tests that can be automated and run every time we upgrade R. And so these will contain not necessarily the exact same version, but something very similar, which would be pretty robust at testing whether something will break or not. So that's something I think we'll be working on. Well, yeah, we we could do that too. Yeah, but we, we I mean we we know all the, the versions and stuff, right? So, sorry. Oh, uh, time's over, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. So when you go on the back and look at the data and yeah. filter it, it doesn't say, you know, there's no indication on the front page to yeah. run it again. No, yeah. Is that a challenge? Um, the way it works or just a bug becoming documented? I mean, we could do it. I mean, there's a lot of details. I mean, that's basically what we want. We want people to use it to tell us, you know, things that should be improved. I mean, you know, frankly, we always have comments and things that I would have never thought about. You're like, well, you know, I, I don't see that. I'm like, well, you know, it's there, right? But to us, it's obvious because we work with it so much that we know exactly what it's doing. And so I think there's going to be challenges in adapting that so that people actually know how to use it as well. But what, what we're going to do as well, and, and this is something that I think has been very successful in, is making videos, sort of as screencasts on how you use different components of the system. So hopefully that would help. And, and actually, I can show you something else too that I think is pretty cool uh, that um, Matt has done for us is, um, which we're going to use throughout is what we call the study tool or just tool in general. So it sort of tell you on how to do things. So if you've never used the system, you log in, you will be taken to a tool like that, which will sort of take you through the different components. And we'll build that as well for the studies and we'll be incorporating that with the module. So could be now that you filter through go and click again. So there will be sort of stuff like that that will be that we will fail. So really trying to make it easier for our um, all users to use it. Are you sorry? Between I know we talked about what's the collaborative data into are you um, when you're trying to get user feedback, are you looking at putting like an in page um, feedback mechanism? Yeah I mean um, again all we have currently is the support forum thing. So that's the only thing we have. And that's certainly something, I mean, that's part of what we have to um, work on for the next year. That's part of our, uh, basically our aims as part of the renewal for this project is basically how do we track usage? How do we get user feedback and things like that? So we'll be working on that. Now, I don't think there's a unique or best solution for it. It's very difficult to get good feedback from people. So. You all want it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you want it first and then we can use it. <laughs> Okay. Right, also, not only was it a live demo, um, those who aren't as familiar with LiveP, that was actually a pre-release version of LiveP 14 3, a um, live demo on data software. Uh, <laughs> 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 but it all worked out great. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>